Aloha and welcome to a live virtual forum on the University of Hawaii at Manoa's updated COVID-19 guidelines. I'm Moani K. Alanavaro and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. We mahalo you so much for joining us here on the set. Here joining us today to answer your questions are, of course, UH Manoa Provost, Michael Bruno. Aloha. Aloha. Nice Moani. to see you. Yes. We also have Dr. Lee Buenconse Holam, Professor and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs of the John A. Burns School of Medicine. She's also a member of the UH COVID-19 Health and Wellness Working Group, the team of UH medical and health experts that have been really advising the university since basically the start of the pandemic, Lee. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you again. And again, mahalo so much for being with us here on our YouTube channel. We'll get to as many of your questions that were submitted as possible within the 90 minute uh, forum today. Topics will include everything from the updated COVID-19 guidelines, uh, available services, we'll touch upon that as well, Provost, health guidance, and a lot more. And we wanna remind you that it's not too late to submit your Nino, your questions through email, eForum at hawaii.edu. And please use your hawaii.edu email account to submit those questions as well. You know, we are only accepting questions from students, faculty, and staff. And with that, I'd like to actually turn to you, Provost Bruno. I think you have some opening remarks to hit us off today. Sure, and thank you, Moani. Aloha, and thank you for taking the time to watch today's public forum. Our goal is to answer as many of your questions as possible and address the concerns that I know are out there. Our campus community consists of more, more than 19,000 undergraduate and graduate students and 5,600 faculty and staff. While many of us are relieved with the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions, others are still concerned and would rather keep some restrictions in place. That's a big reason why we are proceeding incrementally before restrictions are lifted altogether at the end of the spring semester. Although everything is subject to change depending on the status of the pandemic, we are in a new stage of living with COVID-19. More than 95% of our students, faculty and staff are vaccinated. Suspending the vaccination requirements does not unvaccinate anyone. And the expectation is that those rates will remain very high moving forward. We believe the focus now must be on personal responsibility. Vaccination is really no longer about transmission. It is about preventing severe illness and death. Students, employees, and all others who are vaccinated have done what they can to protect themselves, their families, friends, coworkers, and fellow students. It was their personal choice. Those who have opted not to get vaccinated are also making a choice. As a community, we must remember to respect everyone's opinions and concerns, no matter how different they are from our own. As I stated back in a January 11 message to the campus, let's remember to treat each other with aloha, loko maika'i, or kindness, and mutual respect. It is something that collectively we have already been doing throughout this unprecedented health crisis. Please remember to continue to do so. I cannot thank our students, faculty, and staff enough for truly rising to the occasion and sustaining that effort for more than two years with such amazing resiliency. You never stopped learning, teaching, serving our community, making new discoveries, and creating music and art and other creative works that enrich the lives of all people. With that, I want to especially thank Dr. Lee Buenconseo Lum for all of her hard work throughout the pandemic and for being here with me today. We look forward to answering your questions. Mahalo. Mahalo Nui Provost and again, exceptional what we have seen come out with the UH Ohana, as you said, the research, graduating, all of those things throughout the past two years, despite what has taken place across the globe. Now, updates to UH COVID-19 guidelines were announced on March 17th and March 23rd. They officially took effect on March 26th, 
when the state of Hawaii ended its COVID-19 restrictions. That was including face masks, indoors, vaccination, and testing requirements, and the Safe Travels program. Now, the updated UH COVID-19 guidelines all reflect the latest county, state, and federal guidelines and were made in consultation with the UH Health and Wellbeing Working Group. That's the team of UH medical and public health experts and, of course, Lee, a part of that great group that have been guiding the university system throughout the pandemic. All right, let's take a look at some of the UH COVID-19 guidelines. There, there are a lot that we should cover um, that are still required for the remainder of the spring 2022 semester. So face masks indoors still in these specific areas. Those are classrooms, shared laboratories, other instructional spaces and those tightly confined educational spaces such as the advising offices. If you do test positive for COVID-19, we ask you as always stay home, isolate for at least five days until you are fever free for 24 hours without the use of those fever reducing medications and your symptoms are improving. Now for those of you returning to campus after quarantine or isolation, Face masks must be worn around others in all settings for the remainder of the 10 day period. Full or up to date vaccination for students and employees in the health profession or allied health programs. Uh, of course, courses where partner institutions require vaccination. These are medical, nursing, social work, dental hygiene uh, as well. Now, we also want to point out the following guidelines that are no longer required as of March 26. Uh, that includes the daily COVID-19 health screening, screening via the Lumicite UH Health app, face masks indoors, except as identified above, face masks outdoors, including outdoor campus events, uh, visitors providing proof of vaccination or negative test results to access campus events, uploading negative tests for students and employees with approved vaccine exemptions, campus-wide notification of positive COVID-19 cases reported on a UH campus. Instructors or presenters no longer need to be masked while speaking, provided that they do maintain that six foot distance uh, from others. Now the COVID-19 Health and Wellbeing Working Group and UH leadership continue though to strongly encourage everyone who is not up to date with the COVID-19 booster to receive their free vaccination as soon as they are eligible. Please respect as well an individual's personal choice to continue to wear their face mask outdoors and indoors where face masks are no longer required. Given the availability of home tests, the university strongly encourages people traveling out of state to test prior to returning to campus. So a lot of us to cover as well, and uh, the latest on those guidelines can also be accessed on the uhnews.org website as well. A lot to remember, but of course, we'll be getting used to that in the coming weeks into the rest of 2022. So with that being said, um, Lee, Provost, I think we can dive right into the questions. And we'd actually like to start off with you, Lee. Um, maybe you can give us an update on the pandemic. What's the latest? Sure, sure, thanks. So uh, we have some graphics uh, for all of you um, here uh, to, to help augment the, um, uh, you know, what I'm saying. And, and so a couple of things, I think, you know, in Hawaii, we are very fortunate that our B curve is, is down and continues to stay down. Uh, and there you can see it on the screen. What, what I do want to point out are those numbers at the top. So, you know, we all are very happy to see the curve down, but the number in this one, it's the cases per 100,000 people. And why that is, it's what we call an age adjusted or an adjusted rate. And why that's important is because that is how the community levels are determined um, that the CDC uses and therefore that we use um, in the state and at UH. And so you can see it's pretty low. So across the state, it's 9.1. And in here in you know, uh, Honolulu County, uh, again, uh, really, really low. So, so we're happy about that. And this information comes from the HawaiiCOVID19.com you know, website. So, so cases remain low. The other factor that we really are very interested in is, is hospitalizations. 
Uh, but the next graphic actually shows uh, a different view of the same thing. And so here's Oahu uh, and the different shades of blue, the darker blue, the more, um, the more cases are and so we still do see some you know differences in in certain communities having uh, covid more frequently than other communities um, and that can be for a variety of reasons um, but again this particular one is cases per 100,000 and so if you go to this website you can actually scroll your mouse over that particular geographic area uh, i'm from Waihua, and so i would scroll over you know that and see what the rate is for example um, and so then you know at the again individual level in your community where you live you can see really how how common is this right and all of this goes into the determination of are we low, are we moderate, or are we high? And so Hawaii fortunately is, is low. Uh, and, and this is, uh, we have uh, on our UH webpage, we have the UH COVID community levels. And those are uh, very much based on what the CDC has determined. Um, and it's based on not just on the cases, uh, but really on the hospital capacity. And so as many of you recall uh, in January, what at the peak of the, the terrible peak that we had with Omicron, uh, you know, our hospitals were, were really quite full, right? Uh, Queens West had to go on divert. We had many patients um, who didn't have COVID who actually weren't able to get care. Uh, and so across the country now, uh, the, every, every state, every county is using both the uh, number of, of cases, uh, but also the number of people hospitalized. Um, and, you know, the federal government continues to monitor ICU beds. And so those are the things that are factored into the community levels, but also into the UH levels. Now, earlier before this, uh, we just showed a quick flash of our very high rates of uh, COVID-19 vaccination by our students and our employees. Uh, and there it is again. And, uh, you know, the provost emphasized that. And so, you know, we, we really do have the highest rates of vaccination in the state. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're certainly higher than the county and Honolulu County is higher than some other counties. And so that really does help us. You know, I know a lot of people say, well, we hear things about the vaccination waning and, you know, these antibodies and are we protected? And there really are a lot of studies that show, again, you're protected against severe hospitalization, you know? And so, yeah, sure, are people who are fully vaccinated and boosted getting COVID? Yeah, but it's very mild, uh, scratchy throat lasting a couple of hours like oh my gosh and you know they need to be in isolation for five days because they tested positive um, but those folks are not they're not getting hospitalized and so that really is the point of and really it's the point of of really all immunizations is to prevent severe disease. So whether it's the childhood, the baby shots that we get to prevent a severe brain infection or deafness, uh, things like that, or prevent severe cases of chickenpox. Uh, you know, if it's things to, pre to prevent liver, severe liver disease or cirrhosis with hepatitis B. Um, and so now COVID, the vaccines have really moved into that. It's really the shifting. You know, initially I think everyone was very appropriately panicked, right? And so the vaccines uh, were rolled out and the big emphasis was on reducing transmission. But now that we have such high levels of immunity, whether it's from the vaccine or, or natural immunity, meaning that many of us have gotten it, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing these numbers stay low. And I think that's why uh, our, our numbers are c continuing to stay low. Now, you know, we're, sure, uh, the hospitals, you know, small little blips, but three, eight, I mean, that's nothing like the 500 or 600 that we've seen, you know, so we continue to monitor it really, really carefully. But at this point in time, uh, and, you know, we, we will see a few more cases showing up because people just came back from spring break, but that's how it's going to be. So this is, we're going to see these little surges, hopefully none of these big peaks again. So that's, you know, really reassuring. And again, with our um, our high vaccination rate, but also the great majority of all of UH is, is in a healthier, lower risk population. And so we do know now there's very good evidence that folks that are 65 or older or 50 with certain chronic diseases, or if you're an individual on immunosuppressant meds, meaning you have cancer or taking an injectable medicine for you know, psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis, all the things we see on TV, those, those folks are truly, they're moderately to severely immunocompromised. And so they do remain at risk for severe disease. 
But if you look around all of our campuses, the great majority of our students, certainly, but even for a lot of our employees, are really in the lower risk categories, you know. And so with all of that factored in, um, uh, you know, it, it's why we, that, so that's the approach that we took. Uh, now, a lot of questions, oh, what, well, what if, right? What if we surge again? And so we do have, again, on the website, these UH COVID levels. And so right now we're low. Uh, but we monitor those things like hospitalizations, hospital beds, cases, and then if we have to, you know, we'll go back up to and to, to moderate, uh, which is kind of where we were, you know, two months ago. And if it is really terrible, then we'll go up to high. In other words, we'll reinstitute everything like how it was, you know, in, in December, January of last year. So all of this information is on the on the website, and that really is. So we're really trying to remain very science and evidence based, you know, in in the decisions and recommendations. So, oh, and the last question, because it's on everybody's mind, is the booster. Right, because that just got announced yesterday. Again, so this is a second booster for persons who are, so it's not for everybody. It's really for those 65 and over, or 50 with certain conditions, or if you're immunocompromised. And that second booster, it's really a showing we have evidence from Europe and many other places that is preventing those hospitalizations. And so, um, you know, many of my family members got their shots today. Uh, and, and so we definitely urge everyone. Uh, now, one thing that is different uh, is that the great majority of the vaccines are gonna be given in the pharmacies. And so, you know, before, right, we had Hawaii Pacific Health and Queens with these large, everywhere. Uh, but now the, the, the vaccines are widely available in the pharmacies. So, uh, you know, if you um, have access to a mobile device, go to, uh, you, can, you can, there's a whole list at hawaiicovid19.com. There's also the list on oneoahu.org, or you can just go directly to cvs.com or Walgreens, make an appointment. Uh, if you're over 50, you have certain conditions, then, uh, you know, please get your booster as soon as you can. Thanks. Right. Thank you so much, Lee. And, you know, uh, of course, as you mentioned, they've made it a lot easier just to visit, mm. you know, your local CVS yeah. or Long's Drugs, as many of us say mm -hmm. in Hawaii, uh, <laughs> Safeway, things like that, right. right there in your neighborhood. Thank you so much, Lee. Sure. Um, you know, I want to get right into more of the questions that, that have been coming into us uh, via uh, eForum at hawaii.edu. Uh, one question coming in, can students, faculty, staff, or administrators still report to work if they are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> please, please, please stay home if you are having any symptoms. Definitely if you think you've been exposed, if you've come back from travel <laughs> recently, uh, especially or have had a large gathering, again, the symptoms are really very mild. And so no, please, please, please stay home, notify your faculty, your instructors, your supervisors. Uh, and uh, you know, we do recommend if you're having symptoms, you should actually test. And you can test with a home test because those are also widely available. And if the home test is positive, you do not need a confirmatory PCR test. So that's also new because earlier in the pandemic, it was, well, you know, I don't know, and maybe I have to go and get a second or third, you know, nasal. So, and really, the home tests are, when you're, when you're symptomatic, the home tests are really quite good. And so, yeah, if you, if you have symptoms or you tested positive, you, you really do need to isolate. Um, and if you're, or if you're immunocompromised. So the reason why this is in the guidelines is because uh, we do know that folks that are, again, moderately to severely immunocompromised, they never made a great immune response to the first two vaccines. And so their third dose is really like their extra second dose, you know, mm -hmm. whereas a, a, a person who's not immunocompromised got a pretty good boost with the second dose. And so for the immunocompromised, they've actually been able to get their fourth dose now for quite a while. Um, but because they're continuing with their conditions, you know, they just may not be as protected as, as someone who's fully up to date and not immunocompromised. And so that's why if you are immunocompromised and you've been exposed, you also should stay home. What about this one coming in? Do supervisors have the right to send a symptomatic person to get a COVID test? Well, I mean, a, a, a simple answer to that is no, we, we are not, um, we're not deputizing people on this campus to, to serve or to act in any way as, as police officers when it comes to things like masks in a classroom um, or stay home if you are sick. Um, to my point earlier, 
we are asking that everyone behave and uh, particularly with one another uh, and lead with aloha and, and, and care for one another. Um, I hope that it won't be necessary for a supervisor to, um, to question whether someone is healthy enough to be in the office. You know, of course, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, but we don't want to be putting people in that position where um, they feel obligated to uh, in any way, you know, demand a, a, uh, a proof of, of yes, I'm healthy, no, I'm not healthy. I, I, um, I, 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 th I really believe in our community and I, I really believe that we will not have instances on our campus where someone is um, experiencing symptoms and still comes to the office. We have done everything we can with uh, technologies and, and processes for teleworking. And uh, so everybody out there, just stay home if you're sick. Uh, more and more we're saying just stay home if you're ill with any Anything. illness that could be transferred to your coworkers or your fellow students. Right, and does that also apply to supervisor asking an employee to wear a mask as well? I think you did touch upon that. Um, well, certainly if, if they are in an environment um, where um, there has been an agreement or in the case of instructional and advising spaces a requirement, um, we expect that our, our employees, our students, and visitors to campus will follow uh, those uh, those requirements. Right. Um, if, if a person walks into a classroom, if a person walks into the Warrior Rec Center, if a person walks into an advising space that has a sign mask required, we expect those individuals to respect the rules and, and wear a mask. Sure. Well, when will the COVID-19 vaccination be included? This question coming in about the current health clearance requirements that require vaccination for TB, measles, mumps, et cetera? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, and um, not anytime soon is the short answer. And the reason is that it's really um, actually quite a lengthy process to get something into uh, state law that's required. And so uh, again, we just continue to strongly recommend uh, folks to get the vaccine, but uh, we don't anticipate it being a state requirement. Uh, again, we, you know, we're out of the pandemic health emergency, so we don't expect it to be a state requirement anytime soon. Right, and you know, we've had such great questions that have uh, come into us ahead mm -hmm. of the forum, like you've been answering for us, Provost and Lee, and we just wanna remind everyone that's joining us this afternoon, don't forget, you know, we're still taking in those questions, so make sure you email us to uh, email those questions to eForum at hawaii.edu. And we're also asking if you can please use your hawaii.edu email account as questions will be limited to UH Haumana or students, faculty, and staff. And let's get right to the next, next one. We're actually going to focus now on masks. And this one coming in, can you please state the rationale for continuing masks in some settings when the state no longer has an indoor mask mandate? Whoever would like to answer that? I think a, 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 major, uh, a major point in our thinking was that we began the spring semester um, basically with, a, uh, with an agreement um, w with our faculty and our students and their families. Um, we are going to open the campus in a safe way. We are going to hold a majority of our classes in person. And the conditions under which we will do so include a requirement to wear masks in the classroom. Those students registered in good faith with that knowledge. Our faculty signed up to instruct their classes in person with that knowledge. And as a group, we decided, mm -hmm. well, let's let's stick to that bargain, let's stick to that agreement. Um, we only have another month. It's not too much to ask right. of everyone to just don the mask for the classrooms. And those are, with a few exceptions, really the, the only environments in which we are requiring the mask. Well, this one coming in kind of addressing what should we do if a student 
refuses to wear a mask in an educational space like an advising center? Going back to an earlier response, I, 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 I believe and, and um, I, I hope that we don't have uh, many of any of these kinds of situations, but ultimately um, a, uh, an employee, a faculty member or staff member um, can always call um, the uh, Department of Public Safety and um, have someone uh, be politely asked to leave the room and leave perhaps leave campus. Uh, that has always been our um, our agreement, you know, uh, with with our employees and students and their families that uh, that a violation of the rules will result in a person being asked to leave campus. Right, and like you said, reiterating, hoping we don't we don't get there. Yeah, hoping that will not have to be the case. Um, we're gonna move on down, and I know, Provost, you work out at the Warrior Recreation Center. I know you're proud of that. Um, <laughs> this one coming in about, about that space, uh, why does the Warrior Recreation Center still require face masks when it is no longer required in indoor gyms by the state, CDC, and World Health Organization? Um, I have to say, I uh, there are not many um, organizations on campus that have um, gained my respect uh, more than uh, Warrior Rec, Rec Center. Um, the way that they have handled the pandemic while also making sure that our students um, can, uh, can enjoy the gym, can um, have that release from the stress of, of not just their courses, but the pandemic. Um, uh, talking to students and even faculty and staff, um, if if it weren't for the Warrior Rec Center, they 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 I think really would not have been in, in as not just healthy uh, shape physically, but also mentally. So it was I think a crucial crucial um, um, resource for all of them. Um, so having said that, I also respect their decision making in continuing to keep the students, faculty, staff, their own staff um, healthy through uh, the remainder of the semester. And, um, you know, I, I, I respect the, the, the manner in which the decision making was made. I think it was very thoughtful. They looked at not only the density mm -hmm. in the environments, the proximity of one student to another when they're working out, but also the nature of uh, the activity where obviously people are are breathing heavy and um, exerting themselves and just like way back when we talked about theater and dance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we 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 um, recognized immediately early on in the pandemic that there are certain activities that warrant a higher level of protection and I think what the Warrior Rec Center has adopted for the rest of the semester is a very thoughtful and appropriate response and, you know, um, tapping off on what you were talking about, about how it's really provided a space for students and, and faculty throughout um, the pandemic who have really needed that release. You know, a lot of the psychologists at the counseling center here at Manoa, we've done stories with them with UH News, and they've shared about the importance of maintaining your mental health and well-being and exercise, one of those mm -hmm. highly recommended outlets. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thanks, Provost. Um, this one as well coming in, what options do I have if I feel uncomfortable uh, when unmasked students in my class uh, are, are not wearing their mask in my classes next semester? Yeah, there's two questions there. <laughs> um, so obviously none of us has a crystal ball and I think we've learned to not even pretend when it comes to this mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to make uh, projections, but in particular to make a projection four or more months um, from now, uh, we all hope that the, uh, the pandemic will be in the rear view mirror uh, by the time we get to the fall semester. So I hope um, that that question will not be foremost on our faculty's minds, uh, faculty members' minds. I, I, we are going, I, and I really, I want the community to, to know this, and it is with great trust in, 
in Lee and her colleagues that I say that we will do everything we have to to make sure that our, our instructional spaces, our workspaces are safe and, and healthy spaces. And um, Lee went through earlier in, uh, in the program um, the various metrics that we are monitoring, we'll continue to monitor. So I, I really want our faculty and our students and their families to know that if we are saying it is safe mm -hmm. to get into the classroom, if we are saying that we believe it is safe to remove the masks in those classrooms, uh, they can trust that we are basing that on, on real data and on a real understanding of, of the pandemic. Right, and you know, speaking of um, the past couple of years, many students have actually enjoyed having that online course option. There's another part of that question coming in. Will every course have an op option to, to be observed online? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, this is something that all of us, um, faculty, administration, staff, students and their families are, are paying close attention to. Uh, we've learned that it matters. So we've learned that it matters that students have the opportunity to have social engagement with one another and with, with their professors. Um, at the same time, we have learned that for many reasons, um, uh, many of our students prefer to have options in the course modality. And, and many have chosen a mix of online and in person, um, whether that's because of family obligations, because of uh, work obligations, an opportunity maybe to, to, for example, have an entire day without classes and then come in for another day with classes, but in the meantime to have online um, environments. Um, so we have been working with the units, with the deans, uh, the department chairs. Um, I had a meeting with the department chairs just the other day where we talked about this. Many of our programs are offering courses in both modalities. So many, if not most, of our courses that have large enrollments with many sections have a mix of in-person sections and online sections. Mm. Some have hybrid with a mix of the two, and still others have what we call here or there or hot technology, where the professor is in an advanced technology classroom, students in front of them, but also students online. Um, so I think that's our future. I think our future is one where we have a mix of instructional modalities to fit the needs of our students, and I really hope to expand the reach of this great university. Right. You know, I think I think there are people from all around the world that want to learn from our faculty. So, so that I think is going to be as we leave the pandemic behind us. I think I think those uh, mixes of modalities, those options, are going to become a uh, a permanent feature of the campus. Really, and maybe even calling it silver lining out of the pandemic, expanding opportunities that, that were thought maybe not possible before. Absolutely, um, and along with that, the, uh, the knowledge that right. has been gained. Right. Um, I mean, our faculty, I don't know if I can ever thank them enough, going back to March of 2020, with no, with no planning, with no advance notice, boom, we are on lockdown, had to switch all of their classes to online. Um, they did so um, in, in an effective way. And then in the months that followed, including that summer, faculty showed up at, at uh, sem online seminars. Uh, we distributed materials, videos, et cetera, um, so that they could improve their, their online instruction. And I think as time has gone on, I think that's another silver lining. Right. We mm -hmm. have slowly gotten better at online instruction. Not saying that we are as a university perfect in that regard. We still have uh, work to do, but, but we are, our capacity and capability to do online instruction is so much superior mm -hmm. right. than it was two years ago. Right. All right, thanks Provost. And of course we wanna remind you, don't forget if uh, you are still you know, hoping to get your questions in, you can do so. You can email your questions to eForum at hawaii.edu. 
Again, please use your hawaii.edu email account as questions will be limited to UH students, faculty, and staff. And with that said, we have this one coming in. Um, is it okay to still wear a face mask indoors and outdoors while on campus, even though it's not required? Absolutely, please do. Uh, again, we know that everyone has different levels of personal risk. Everyone's family situations or their housing situations are different. Uh, and, and so please feel comfortable. In fact, today, um, as I was parking here, there were many people wearing their masks outdoors and it was fine. And or they were uh, without a mask as they should be. But then when they came by, then they, you know, very automatically just put the mask on. And, and that's really, I think, what is going to stay, you know, at least at least through the rest of the semester. Um, because, you know, when I go to the store, everyone is still wearing a mask. Right, it's kind and of a mix. It's, it's a Sometimes mix. you see yeah, more. And it's okay. And, you know, I think people have learned that, all right, if I feel I'm a little bit higher risk, uh, then I'll wear a mask and I'll move myself and I'll make sure that I have six feet physical distancing. And and it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think getting back to the previous question about um, if someone's not comfortable with an unmasked student in the room, well, as a faculty, we can always wear a mask, right? It's always our individual choice to wear a mask. So I think that uh, goes a long way to, um, to help, you know, just mentally keeping us safe because we do know the masking is, is really quite effective. Right, and I know, Provost, you've mentioned time and time again, respecting everyone's choice to wear a mask, not wear a mask in, in those areas where they're no longer required. Um, this one coming in, will masks be required after the spring semester? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Again, it really will depend on the community level. You know, if everything uh, stays how it is now, which is low, then, you know, maybe not. Uh, but really a little bit too early to tell at this point. Okay, we're going to transition now to um, this question based off of vaccinations. Um, what is the rationale for no longer requiring full vaccination for students? So uh, let me take this first and I'll, I'll ask Lee to, to weigh in. Um, what we really did is we disconnected the act of registra registration from vaccination. That's really all that we did. Uh, we decided as a group, hey, this it's March. We're making a decision that is going to affect the students coming in in the fall. Remember, Mo the vast majority of our students who will be registering in the fall, for the fall, are already vaccinated. Right. Because we only lose a couple thousand students out of 19,000. So, um, so, so that's number one. But, but really the essence of the decision was let's give ourselves the opportunity to continue to watch what is actually happening on the ground with respect to the pandemic and uh, follow those metrics and as we come in after commencement into the summer, uh, base our decision making on, on the pandemic and also, frankly, availability of vaccines, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. even new vaccines. So there's so much unknown. It didn't seem to us to make sense to in any way tie the, 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 the registration for the fall mm -hmm. to a level of vaccination that for most people goes back to last summer you know so uh, so that really was the essence of the decision um, we have other ways to enforce a vaccination requirement if we needed to do that right you know we all hope that we don't need to do it but that was the essence of the decision mm -hmm. maybe yep. we yep. I think add. Okay. okay moving right along here are there situations where proof of vaccination will still be required at UH any instances there well, yes, in fact, uh, for the, um, the School of Medicine, uh, nursing, social work, and several allied health programs, uh, because the students and the, and the employees, actually, many are embedded in facilities that have a very strict vaccination requirement, require proof. In fact, we just had to submit a huge list yesterday to one of our partner training sites. And so for those instances and programs, where the vaccination requirement and the documentation is necessary to complete that particular course of study, 
then in fact that school you know may continue the vaccination requirement and that's certainly the case for us at the school of medicine so yes there will be a few and what about for campus visitors are there any vaccine or test related requirements nope. for visitors not at this time all right nothing required how about this one are new employees required to be vaccinated or an approved exemption to be eligible for employment Yes, new employees are required to either show proof of vaccination or apply for an exemption. Um, so this is consistent with state um, policy right now. So we are following uh, the state in that respect. Okay. Um, this one as well, when will prospective employees no longer be required to be vaccinated to be eligible for employment at UH. Do we have a time frame? I don't think there is a time frame on that. Okay. And we just want to remind everyone as well, great information coming in from Lee as well as Provost. So this uh, entire forum will actually be posted on uhnews.org on Monday. So next week, Monday. So if you want to, you know, scroll through and try and get to some of those target questions that uh, are of interest to you, you'll also have that available. All right, we're going to move on to the daily health check. And um, Provost, maybe we can turn to you for this one. Why was the required Lumacite UH daily check discontinued? Um, in, in, really, in the first instance, we, we are following the, uh, the state policy. So the, um, the emergency order ended. Um, uh, effective um, March 26, I guess would be that would have been the last day. Um, so up until that day, we were we were requiring uh, visitors and and actually anybody going into many of our facilities, including athletic facilities, uh, to show proof of their status um, with respect to vaccination or show a negative test. Um, so we followed. The state, we are, after all, the state's university. These are state facilities and buildings. So, so that was really the, the essence of the decision making there. Okay. Um, let's also talk about events as well. A lot to be excited about with commencement mm -hmm. um, in person coming up soon, very soon. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of people, of course, large events um, with, with our kupuna, our, our senior citizens attending. Um, this next set of questions, you know, really helped to address the many questions we've received mm -hmm. about the university's plans for safety at these events. So first one here, how safe is it, Lee, to attend a large indoor gathering like commencement? Sure, sure. And I understand that's at the top of everyone's right. mind. Uh, the dean and I had a meeting earlier today with, the, with our medical students. And, and uh, you know, so again, going, it really boils down to those community levels. And so um, if you look at the CDC website, if you're in an area with low transmission, there actually are not any further restrictions, you know, with, with regards to, to large events. Having said that, however, you know, we want to keep our kapuna safe, right? And so, um, you know, indoor masking is, is certainly prudent uh, if you're going to be at a really large, uh, max, you know, capacity event, especially if um, it's, you know, it's a public event, right? Or it's a mixed situation uh, where you're really just not sure what percent, you know, we're, we're pretty confident, you know, we, we have proof of what percent of our students are vaccinated, but we don't have that for the public. And, you know, Commencement is essentially the public, right? Right. And so, uh, so masking though is still definitely you know the safest way. The ultimate safe way though is you know please if you feel sick, <laughs> do not come. And that's really tough, but it's just really important you know that if you have symptoms, do do not just do not come. Yeah. And I you know I want to add to that, and and uh, on a happy note. Um, we all, I think, agree. Commencement is uh, is is the uh, is the the best day of the year. Commencement day, um, and and our commencement events are like n none other in the world, anywhere. Any everybody watching knows that. So it's great that we can have an in-person commencement. It's also amazing that when we went out with an email to all of the students who have graduated since May of 2020, 
May 2020, December 2020, May 21, December 21, and of course this May, so many of the students and their families said, we want to come. Right. And, and so many that we had to add another commencement <laughs> ceremony. <laughs> I think you guys are Friday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the med school and, <laughs> and a few others are on the Friday. So instead of a Saturday morning and a Saturday afternoon, we have a Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon. Uh, because we have thousands of students coming back to walk in their commencement. So it's, it's a really, uh, for, for all of us, it's, it's a great thing to be able to do for our students and their families to give them that opportunity. So. And I think, you know, it, it will be like no other. You know, all of us have been through through some very tough times, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think emotionally it will be even more emotional, yeah. right, to share sure. that sure. accolade with our ohana. All right, thank you, Provost. And actually, if I could add to the safety is preventing yourself from getting sick. So this is where, again, just basic hand hygiene, right, and uh, trying to avoid people who are actively sneezing in your face. I mean, all of those things, <laughs> right. uh, you, you know, that are common sense, but honestly, we probably didn't pay much attention to it before COVID. Well, you know, we've shown that, in fact, it has really helped. That's why we have so little flu and, mm -hmm. and so little people out for other respiratory illnesses. Whereas, you know, before, one person has a cold, the entire class gets sick, right? And, and so, um, you know, just, just plan in advance and, you know, maybe do some extra good hand washing you know, <laughs> that week, seriously, that week before commencement so that everybody can just really come and, and enjoy. Right, we heard it straight from our doctor here <laughs> on set. Wash your hands. Right, you know, at this time as well, we're, we're just gonna just take a short break. Uh, please feel free to, you know, get up, stretch, grab a drink of water. Uh, use the Lua if you need to as well. We'll be back in about five minutes for the second half of today's forum. Thanks so much for sticking with us. Hereby proclaim February 28, 2022 as Alice Augusta Ball Day. <laughs> Alice Ball was one of the most remarkable uh, members of the UH community. Uh, the fact that she made amazing contributions for Hawaii, the world, while here as a young black woman whose work was overlooked for decades. Um, today was just an opportunity to try to begin to make that right. And I think that it's important for current and future uh, students, especially black students, to be connected to Alice's legacy of educational excellence at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And so it's not uh, just important for black students, but for all students. But when I talk about it being important for black students, it's because um, we know that representation matters. And so when we see ourselves written in the academic canon, we see ourselves as part of the campus culture, and hopefully enhances our sense of belonging um, on campus. And so I think that's why her legacy is important, as well as why this day um, and celebration is also equally as important. With Governor Ige's proclamation of February 28th as Alice Ball Day um, forevermore, we really have an opportunity to remind people of the importance of honoring the contributions of all members of our community.
two squadrons comprising 16 torpedo bombers, carriers Soyu, and to pass on Japan's social region following international norms. Japanese consulate had fallen from a torpedo strike targeted by another set of aircraft. By Hibari Tiga, 49 bombers hit you and the radar. And the radar. In the history books, we could like read it and then we'll like imagine it in our minds, but the VR headsets actually showed us what it really was. I wanted to bring our story, my story, my family, our culture, Hawaii, um, and just be able to showcase that on the runway and let people know about Hawaii, about our culture, about these prints and their meanings, and I think we did that tonight. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be able to attract them from all different majors throughout campus, all the campuses. And now that we have our own building, you know, it's like a beacon in the night for entrepreneurs. It's unlike anything you can imagine. The whole sky goes dark, uh, everything gets cold. You wouldn't think, instantaneously, the air temperature drops. Uh, all the animals in the region just start you know, freaking out, birds, dogs, everything. Um, and the sky just lights up with the sun's corona. Aloha and welcome back, and thanks to UH News for sharing those awesome stories with us. You are watching a live virtual forum right here on the University of Hawaii at Manoa campus. We're taking a look at the updated COVID-19 guidelines 
as well. I'm Moani K. Ella Navarro. Thanks again so much for being with us. I'll be your moderator. I have the pleasure of being on set with Dr. Lee Buen Consejo Lum from Jabsum, and we also have UH Manoa Provost Michael Bruno. Aloha again to you both. Aloha. All right, and we're going to dive back into questions uh, that actually continue to come in. So thanks so much to our viewers for submitting that. Um, this one based on course delivery. Uh, what will be the breakdown of courses in the fall and what percentage will be taught in person and online? Provost. So it varies from college to college. Overall, we are at around 85 percent. Um, in, per, in person. Um, that number is a bit misleading because we have a number of our colleges that are over 90 percent um, and some actually essentially at 100 um, percent. I've been telling people over the last month or so it's one of the striking features of, of this answer and this question is that prior to the pandemic we never counted so I, you know, three years ago, I would not have been able to answer that question. Um, and it turns out that many of our units, um, College of Education comes to mind, um, have always had a, a good number of their courses offered online just because of the, uh, the type of student that they are serving. Uh, many of their programs are serving practicing professionals in other words, in most cases, teachers. Right, so they have that flexibility Exactly. They need. Exactly, so maybe they wanna go into uh, academic administration, become a principal, so we have programs devoted to them. And, and likewise, a few other uh, units are social sciences um, and a few other colleges um, have traditionally had, always had online courses. And so what we're seeing in that 85% kind of number is uh, situations where one college might be 80% in person and another college is 100% right. in person. So it, it's a mixed bag, but uh, for all intents and purposes, the fall looks um, very much like a quote unquote normal semester with the caveat um, we were talking earlier about uh, many of our units went out of their way to offer students a choice of online and in person. So, you know, that certainly has has added to the number of online offerings. And you know, we we're, we're getting all sorts of questions and we want to make sure that we, we get to as many as we can and this one actually sounds like we we've, we've answered it a little earlier but maybe some of you are are just joining us right now. So, uh, if we could kind of touch upon this one as well, are there plans to continue to offer more classes online um, than UH previously did before the pandemic, Provost? Yes, um, I believe that that is the direction uh, in, uh, in which we are heading. We, uh, we have learned that students, um, and in many cases their families, really support the notion of having options. And, and being able to, to have a semester in which they have a mix of online modality and in person. And, uh, and there are many reasons for those. We discussed those earlier, including family and job responsibilities. Uh, so I think, um, and uh, we're not alone in this. Um, universities worldwide are, are really looking at um, what the future holds in terms of offering those, those modalities, those choices. Um, you know, maybe you can touch upon this as well. How will the university offer support to faculty as they transition back into the classroom? I, th I think the primary um, area of support is to provide them with a comfort level and a confidence that uh, the, the instruction and work environments in which they are uh, entering are safe. and, and um, I, I am confident that we will be able to do that, and we'll, uh, so we'll continue to do that. So uh, that's number one. Number two, as far as uh, supporting their instruction, we will continue to uh, provide uh, training opportunities, uh, resources, uh, classrooms with advanced technology. Um, I, I know there are some faculty who have not been back to campus. 
uh, since March of 2020. Uh, I would encourage those faculty to walk around campus. We have a brand new building that opened on campus, the Life Sciences Building. Um, and if they walk in and around uh, the various classroom buildings, they'll see many changes, in particular to our technologies in the classroom. So, um, so those are primary levels of support, but in particular the support uh, that leads to a healthy environment. This one specifically uh, about the TAs, um, as classes and more labs transition back in person, what resources will be offered to TAs who may or may not be trained or exposed to teaching in person? We have always had training um, programs for teaching assistants, and we will continue to do that. Um, I'm not, um, I've not been in meetings talking about in any way changing those. We did provide the teaching assistants uh, with the same type of training as we did faculty for um, transitioning from an on, from an in-person environment to online. So certainly those training opportunities will be there, but uh, we will continue with the quote-unquote traditional training opportunities for all of our teaching assistants. What sick pay will the university offer to TAs who are exposed to COVID and test positive while they are teaching and are actually too ill to teach? So we have continued throughout the pandemic to, um, to message that our students, including our teaching assistants, our research assistants should not come to campus um, if they are, are feeling ill, if they have symptoms, if they've come in close, in close contact with somebody who, who tests positive for COVID. Um, and we have also made clear that none of those students will lose pay as a result of missing their work. So that has never been an issue. I'm disappointed that that question is still out there, right. honestly. Right. Uh, moving on down, um, this one coming in, is UH considering building capacity for more outdoor teaching or activities? We are one of the few universities with weather for year-round outdoor instruction. Yes, but it rains a lot at Manoa. Beautiful Manoa a rain, Beautiful right? Manoa Valley. <laughs> um, and it gets hot often. Um, in, in Manoa Valley. So um, um, I cannot, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because we've had many meetings about this. Mm. Um, you read about other places around the country that set up tents and whatnot. And, and you know, we've, uh, we actually have a, a map of the campus that I have distributed to all of the units that um, is a result of a survey done by our uh, our professionals in the School of Architecture that, that um, identifies the areas that have open but covered spaces. So uh, these are spaces like Scheidler and, 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 and architecture and, and areas around Post and, and other areas around the art, bu art building where, where you have covered but relatively open space. And, and and we've made clear to units that uh, if they want to uh, move desks and chairs outside and conduct classes in the outside environment, we are very supportive uh, with the caveat that they have to clean up. They need to right. move all that equipment back in. So, so um, we have had units that have conducted um, classes sometimes on an ad hoc basis um, outside. But uh, we've not moved to any sort of formal outdoor environments. We're not we're not numbering, you know, the space outside art auditorium as a as a classroom. We're not assigning outdoor spaces, but we are certainly going to be continuing to be supportive of any faculty who want to do so. Sure. Um, we've got some miscellaneous questions, so they're you know a wide spectrum. Mm -hmm not particularly um, any topic. What about UH community members with toddlers at the on-campus preschool program? Is it safe for them with the greater risk of exposure since we are now allowing COVID-19 positive people on campus? 
Sure. So I can certainly understand where the worry and the questions come from. Right? The vaccine is not available yet for uh, children under five. Uh, but it's really important to recognize that if you're test positive, you need to stay home for five days at least. Um, and you can come back if you haven't had a fever for 24 hours, so, you know, without the, reduce, without the use of fever-reducing medicines, um, and if your symptoms are substantially better. And when you do come back, you absolutely have to wear a mask in all settings. And the reason that's important, and that's for the duration of 10 days, right? So, um, you, uh, you know, there's still a chance that you are infectious. In fact, we know, and that's the reason for the, the, the isolation and the return to work guidelines, is that um, after you're infected with COVID, yes, there are still lower levels of virus that are circulating around and that you could transmit uh, to others if you don't wear a mask. And so that's why it's just really important for those that are um, coming back that they wear a well-fitted mask. That means, you know, crimped over your nose, fully covering everything. In all settings, don't eat or drink with anyone, don't ride public transportation, don't travel. Um, and people are like, well, where? And that's the, that's the CDC guidelines. And again, it's because it's just really important for those full 10 days to really wear your mask all the time. And that's gonna be the best protection. And that is how it's been from the beginning. The child care centers never closed. Uh, and uh, you know many of the, the preschools in the community also, they've, they've stayed open. But that's how you keep them safe, is you really make sure that everyone understands the importance of staying home when you're sick and wearing your mask if you're gonna come back you know, from, from quarantine or from isolation. Right, right, thanks Lee. Um, when can we expect all dining options to return? Manoa Gardens, food trucks, Pizza Hut, Stir Fresh? Manoa Gardens Making is me open. <laughs> oh, okay. Manoa yeah. Gardens back open. Manoa Gardens is open, um, and uh, you know, the hours are. Uh, I think they are open till six p.m. Oh, on okay. on many days until later, um, maybe eight p.m. on some days. So, um, Baile is open, and uh, they started um, with. Uh, reduced offerings, but I'm told that is being expanded significantly now. As everyone knows, Campus Center Food Court has been open, Subway, uh, Jamba Juice opened up several months ago, um, and uh, Paradise Palms is open. I saw a long line for Panda. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I, our, um, so some of those are are um, individual um, enterprises that um, have a contract with us. Um, most of the area around, including the, the campus center, is through Sodexo, um, our uh, food uh, supplier. Um, so um, they have, in all cases, had to um, watch to see what the level of customers was. So what people have seen, those of us who have been on campus, is as more people have come back to campus, more mm -hmm. has opened up. And, uh, and, and, and I expect that that's gonna continue. So the food trucks, um, my understanding is this is not us, this is those independent businesses right. needing to have a level of certainty that the, uh, that the traffic, uh, the customer level, uh, will be there for them for to make it worth their while, and as more people come back, more will come back in terms of providing food service. We'll see more open. Okay, um, air hygiene more important than surface hygiene, according to some experts. Uh, is anyone going to fix air quality at UH? So the question is worded in a way that suggests that we have poor air quality at UH. That is not true. Um, in fact, the vast majority of our buildings um, already have advanced um, air handling systems um, that recirculate the air, which is a key component of, of improving or, or um, ensuring uh, good air quality. 
um, those systems would also have filters um, and so um, people can be assured that you know the, the, the vast majority of buildings um, uh, the older buildings um, we do have some older buildings on campus uh, where it would be prohibitively expensive to uh, completely redo a central air conditioning or install a central air conditioning system um, most of those buildings have the ability to open windows um, if so if you look at the CDC guidance it, it indicates that even opening a window some inches mm -hmm. Um, and ensuring cross flow goes a long way to improving the, uh, the quality of the air inside. Um, we have on a few occasions also provided um, those units with uh, portable mm -hmm. air filter, uh, air, filtra air filtration yeah. systems. Um, so we have done that. Um, but as I said, those, uh, those environments are few and far between. Um, so, um, but we are, we're conscious about the need in some of those cases to provide those um, individual portable air handling systems. Okay. And as we speak, you know, questions are still coming into us uh, via our e-forum at hawaii.edu address. So let's kind of dive into those as well before we wrap up, wrap up this afternoon. Um, maybe we can turn to Lee for this one. Can immunocompromised people really feel safe? on campus? Sure, that's a great question. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, you know, again, if you're immunocompromised, uh, certainly if you want to wear a mask, you are welcome. I advise my patients to do that all the time. Uh, and when they go to the store, you know, and, and the reality again is that we have such a high vaccination rate that if you're immunocompromised, you actually, you know, are taking, you have a much higher chance of of getting exposed to COVID in a store or a restaurant or some other public gathering where we, we don't know and where we are pretty certain we don't have 95% vaccination rate. So I would say yes, very feel, you can feel very safe here, uh, but again, individuals can always wear their, their mask. Right. Um, why is the metric hospitalization and serious illness um, and not preventing long-term disability via long COVID. Yeah, that's a you know that's a really wonderful question, um, and it, part of it is is what you can measure reliably, you know, and the the definition of long COVID. I mean, you can have so many symptoms that could be long COVID. It's, it's a it's a time based you know symptoms lasting more than eight weeks. It's actually really hard to measure. It mm. really impossible to measure, actually, from a public health standpoint. And so, when when our health officials are making these decisions, you have to go with again what's what's reliable data. Having said that, though, the best way to prevent long COVID is to get vaccinated. You know, and and yes, again, back to earlier, are boosted individuals uh, still getting COVID? Sure, periodically but it tends to be mild, you know, uh, and um, the, the reports of long COVID so far seem to be, if you, if you had really severe illness, your chances of getting long COVID are really, really high. You know, I think there's still a lot of research going on around the world is, can you still get long COVID from mild illness? Mm. And there are reports of that, but the overwhelming majority are people who have been sick, sick enough to be in the hospital. And so again, it's, it's, it started out with a data question. A lot of it is what you can measure, but um, uh, you know, and again, if you feel that you're at particular risk, uh, then uh, please get vaccinated, get your booster uh, and or you know, wear a mask and, and, and that's the best way to protect yourself. Not sure who wants to pick this one up. Will there be an update to the current non-COVID and COVID telework policy? Maybe that question for you, Provost. Um, so, you're right. The question is, is, is correctly worded in that there are two different telework policies in place. The, uh, the so-called COVID telework um, has been modified so that it really is aimed at allowing people who have been exposed mm -hmm. to someone who tests positive um, but still is well enough to work to go ahead and continue to work uh, from home or remotely. Um, that 
policy. I'm not sure where we are. I think we're going to continue that conversation about mm -hmm. whether that policy should be extended perhaps even indefinitely. Um, again, the aim there is to, to um, encourage people to stay home when it's appropriate to stay home, but allow them to continue to, to be productive and, and, and work while they're, while they're home. Um, the non-COVID telework, um, eventually I think we'll just call that our telework policy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it's intended to be. Uh, many people might not um, realize that this university has never had a telework policy. Mm -hmm. So this was a first. Mm -hmm. And the fact is we rolled out the non-COVID telework policy during COVID. So uh, there's been some confusion. The, uh, the non-COVID policy uh, is in place. The non-COVID telework policy is in place. It's permanent. Um, we rolled it out um, with a, uh, a one-year maximum um, period. But in most cases, particularly at Manoa, we have asked our supervisors to consider it for a short duration at first, uh, primarily the academic year, so until the end of May. And uh, we will begin speaking with the units um, in uh, actually a, a week from now, uh, the first meeting, to discuss with the units, how's it going? You know, what do you see in your area? Are we still providing essential services to students? to employees? Um, do we need to reconsider? Um, should we open it up for longer periods after, in our case, the end of May? Um, so that's something we're, we're going to speak to. We are speaking to system human resources about, you know, it, in, in tandem with, with these conversations, should we be rolling out additional guidance to the units, to the supervisors? But um, but uh, telework will be with us. Um, it's here to stay. Um, it, it really is a matter of how best to, uh, to implement it to make sure that we're providing, again, the, the services, the work uh, that we need to on behalf of the people of Hawaii. Sure. Okay. Um, this one going, taking us back to the Warrior Rec Center, of course, still uh, required uh, to wear masks while you're in the center. Um, this question saying, isn't it dangerous for people to work out with masks as it inhibits proper breathing when doing those intense workouts? Um, isn't wiping down the machines before enough? Lee, maybe you'd sure, like to? Sure, that's a, a great question. Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies that actually show working out and doing exertion with a mask is fine. It does not reduce your oxygen level. It does not increase your carbon dioxide level. Uh, and, um, and, and people have been doing heavy exercise for the last two years. You know, our, our athletes, in fact, are required Right, to uh, to do their practices and, and the NCAA and pretty much every I mean the Olympics so 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 I think there's still that um, misunderstanding out there but but there's really solid evidence that there's no um, detriment to the oxygen uh, and so the second part of the question is the wiping down um, and wiping down is absolutely important it was important pre-COVID and it's mostly just because of the sweat and you know other things um, well, mostly sweat. Um, and, and so, it, you know, I, again, at, at this point, the reason why they're uh, still requiring the masks, it was a very, very thoughtful decision. And because the primary customers are, in fact, our faculty and students, and like Provost said, we have a commitment to, we started out the semester really wanting to have the safest learning environment. And right. so given that their population is the same people that we're trying to maintain the safety for, it really does make sense to continue it. How about this one coming in? Um, oh, Provost, did you want to say something? No, okay. no, perfect. All right, okay, we've got this one as well. What makes the university think now is a good time to actually loosen mask mandates and other protocols? How do you think this change will impact student life? Great. Well, the um, and we have a graphic uh, and on the website about our COVID community levels, 
And so we base the decision and the recommendation, one, on what the CDC says. And, you know, they have brilliant, brilliant scientists, uh, and really from all over the world, who spent months trying to model and determine how, what's the best way to make these recommendations moving forward. And so the uh, COVID community level for, hot, for actually all of Hawaii, every county, is low. And that is based on this number of staff hospitalization beds, hospitalized beds, and you know the, the number of cases per 100,000, et, et cetera. Uh, and then we also have the highest vaccination rates in the state. Right? And we're also continuing with the indoor masking for those instructional spaces. So that's really, the, again, that combination of all those factors is why you know, we felt that it was time to um, loosen up on some of the, the restrictions. Um, as far as the second question, the impact on student life, you know, um, I think students are happy to be back in person <laughs> um, and to be able to gather and to be able to hang out and eat lunch and not really have to worry about having to, you know, put the mask on in between every bite, which is really what it had to be, uh, y you know, several months ago. So, um, you know, we hope it's, it's going to have a, a good impact. We've got some great feedback from our students. Having said that, there's always folks that, again, are a little nervous. And so, again, that's fine. We all have different comfort levels. Mm -hmm. And if you want to hang out with your friends but be kind of further apart while you're eating and talking story, great. Just talk loud. And, and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. And what was that again? Yeah. <laughs> great, great mana'o, Lee. Thank you. Um, we're down to two questions left in our uh, 2022 forum here with uh, Provost Michael Bruno and Dr. Lee Wuen Konseho Lam. Um, we're also being asked this, new employees required to be vaccinated, we covered that. Does that include graduate student employees and student helpers, Provost? No, um, those students are students first. And so they don't fall into that category. And again, that, um, that policy is based on the policy that is currently in place in the state. And so we're following that, that state policy. But no, students are students first. Okay, and the last question for today. Um, this one's saying, is there specific data as to why UH is the last university in the country to require masks indoors? I'm proud of that. <laughs> I mean, we are, we are sticking to our commitment to our students, their families, and our faculty. That um, in those instructional environments, the labs and the classrooms, um, they will wear masks. And uh, we will get through one more month. Um, that person who wrote that question, be patient. One more month. Um, it's a small price to pay to, number one, stick by our commitment, and number two, get through this rest of the semester in a really safe and healthy way. Right. And then if I could just add one more thing, again, the thing that makes Hawaii unique is that we are geographically isolated, mm -hmm. right? And so while, yes, we, we were the last, we we're the last state, um, but we did it for a very specific reason. Uh, we saw in January that we were at full capacity. We had to wait for all of the federal workers to come in, and they were being pulled everywhere else in the country. Right. Uh, and we had so many workforce shortages, and this is mm -hmm. hospitals, nursing homes, care homes, everywhere. And we don't, it, it's, it's just us. You know, we cannot easily rely on somebody driving across the state. And so that's really what makes Hawaii and Puerto Rico very unique. So Puerto Rico also was kind of slow to reduce, but it's because if we have a huge surge that impacts our hospital capacity, we, we really are in trouble. And, and so again, that's the rationale for why we are so slow. It's because we really have a duty to keep everyone safe. Right. Yeah. Different factors yeah. that separate us from literally the rest of the yeah. country, right? Well, that is all the time that we have right now for questions. Um, However, if your questions were not addressed today, please feel free to email COVID19 at hawaii.edu and we'll of course be sure to get to them as well. Uh, before we go, we'd like to also recap the updates to the guidelines that are in effect. And we've got some um, updated uh, bullet points that can help you as well because I know there's a lot to cover. Um, 
Those guidelines reflect the very latest county, state, and federal guidelines and were actually made in consultation with the UH Health and Wellbeing Working Group. That's the team of UH medical and public health experts that have been guiding the university system uh, throughout the past couple of years during the pandemic. All right, so taking some time to look them over here, um, this is what's still required for the remainder of the spring 2022 semester, face masks indoors in these specific areas, classrooms, shared laboratories, other instructional spaces, and those tightly confined educational spaces. We're talking about areas like those advising offices on campus. If you test positive for COVID-19, stay home. We've heard Dr. Lee tell us that throughout the forum. Isolate for at least five days until you are fever free for 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medication and your symptoms are improving. Now for those returning to campus after quarantine or isolation, those face masks must be worn around others in all settings for the remainder of that 10 day period. Full or up to date vaccination for students and employees in the health profession or allied health programs uh, or courses where partner institutions require vaccination, uh, medical nursing, social work, uh, dental hygiene as well. Um, the following guidelines that we're going to bring up now no longer required as of March 26. That's the daily COVID-19 health screening uh, via the Lumasite UH Health app, face masks indoors, except as uh, we just mentioned those areas, uh, face masks outdoors, including outdoor campus events, visitors providing proof of vaccination or negative test results to access campus events, uh, uploading those negative tests for students and employees with approved vaccine exemptions, a campus wide notification of positive COVID-19 cases reported on a UH campus, uh, instructors or presenters no longer needed to be masked while speaking provided though that they maintain that six foot distance from others. The UH COVID-19 Health and Wellbeing Working Group and UH leadership, of course, continue to strongly encourage everyone, all of us who are not up to date with a COVID-19 booster to receive their free vaccination as soon as they are eligible. And we just ask that you please respect an individual's personal choice uh, to continue to wear that face mask outdoors and indoors where those masks are no longer required. Uh, given the availability, as Dr. Lee had said, of home tests, uh, the university strongly encourages people traveling out of state just to test prior to returning to campus. And again, as a reminder, uh, a lot to take in and something we'll all get used to, of course, but uh, if you do need uh, to take a look at the guidelines in its entirety, you can always log on to uhnews.org as well. And Provost, you know, we, we just want to turn to you. You know, you gave um, insightful opening remarks for us as to what we've endured uh, the past couple of years with the pandemic. And I know that you've got uh, some closing words for us as well this afternoon. Thank you, Mani. I, I just want to say mahalo again to everyone who sent in their questions and all of you who tuned in to today's forum. As Mani said, if you have more questions or concerns, please email. And a big mahalo to Lee <laughs> for being here, for always being here, and her dedication to the college. Uh, also to the College of, so I meant to the university, also to the College of Social Sciences, digital studio team, your students, your advisor, Sherry White, for your professional, your professional uh, work, your professionalism throughout the preparation and the conduct of this forum. Um, I love the fact that this is a student-run production. They always do a great job. Uh, those of you who are watching can't see, but I'm looking right at our students <laughs> when I'm saying awesome. this. Um, uh, you guys are just awesome, and we're all so proud of this and our ability to be able to do this with you all. Uh, to the Office of Communications for the planning, uh, all your behind the scenes work, big mahalo. And last but not least, to Mo Moani, our moderator today, um, who I'm proud to say is, is the UH Manoa spokesperson and also a proud alumna. Right. Best Very wishes 
Oh, this is to you. Are you going to say goodbye to everybody? No, no. I mean, we uh, wanted to just take a moment, Provost, uh, mahalo as well for your words, and, and we echo you on that. This team here that we have in the studio, these Helman, I'm telling you, next generation, so proud of what they will be doing um, in the TV broadcasting industry. But we do want to clarify real quick. Uh, we just want to remind you that the grad students are required uh, to be vaccinated. So just wanted to clarify that for everyone this afternoon before we let you go. But again, grad student employees, that is, uh, are required to be vaccinated. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, and on that note, you know, we do want to uh, send our best, best wishes to everyone for the remainder of the semester. And of course, to those Helmana who are graduating. Uh, we'll see you in May. That's right. And and will will we see you there, Provost? Of oh, course. I'll be up there on the stage handing out of the course. diplomas. All right. We can't wait for that. And on that note, we, we do wish you uh, all a, a great rest of the spring 2022 semester. Thank you so much for joining us, Lee, Provost Bruno as well. And to all of you, thanks so much for tuning in with us and spending this time as well in the studio here at UH Manoa. We ask you to stay safe and for all the latest news across the UH system, tune in to uhnews.org all through the week. Aloha.